All right, uh, welcome to Silver Lining episode 57. Amazing, 57. Today we have uh, two very special guests, Jamie Basham from the University of Kansas and Trey Vasquez from uh, University of Central Florida. And uh, we, we wanna focus today on two things, actually it's one thing, but you know, two parts. One is really about uh, educational innovations, especially in technology and its application in special education. Both uh, Jamie and, uh, uh, and Trey are great experts and leaders in this field. Also, the, another part I want to talk about um, a new national center trying to get this technolo technological innovations into more teacher education programs, into more higher education. The national center is trying to help others you know, uh, to bring the whole country, uh, all higher education institutions into this. So we want to say, how do we build a new national center? How do we spread the word? So before anything else, I would like to start with uh, maybe Jamie. Do you want to talk a little bit about uh, the current research? What we know, what you've done this a lot and uh, on ed you know, educational innovations in special education. Jamie. Young, thanks, uh, thanks for having us, everyone. Uh, we're honored to be here. Uh, it's it's great. I just saw you had a celebration of uh, the, the number of podcasts you've had recently. So it's kind of great that you've uh, kept this going so long. So yeah, so my work and the work that I've done over the last oh, uh, too many years, I guess, <laughs> uh, uh, really focuses on uh, how technology uh, can be used in classroom to support students with disabilities, but really focused on all learners. So I focus a lot of my work on universal design for learning or UDL as it's known. I know you guys are having a show coming up on, on that pretty soon here, uh, but UDL is a uh, design framework for supporting all learners um, in, in various learning environments. And as we really think about the learning experience. So I actually have, as, as Young knows, um, I have, I kind of sit as a professor at the University of Kansas, but then also as a senior director of learning and innovation at CAST, which are the founders of UDL. So I kind of have two hats that I wear. Um, so my work is really on the intersection of that and how do we integrate and support UDL in learning environments, whether they be uh, physical learning environments or digital learning environments. As Chris knows, he was um, one of our technical work group advisors for the Center for Online Learning Students with Disabilities a few years ago. So um, a lot of the work we've been doing over the last, or a lot of the work that I do is really around how do we support better learning environments for all kids and with that intersection of UDL and technology. All right, thanks, Jamie. Uh, Trey, you want uh, to a self-introduction about your work and uh, the work you see, what's going on? Sure, welcome. Thank you for having me on. I'm Trey Vasquez. I'm a professor at the University of Central Florida and also the director for the Tony Jennings Exceptional Education Institute. Um, my background is starting life as a middle school math teacher and then converted to a school psychologist and behavior analyst and served in that role for a few years before I transitioned to the world of professoral. And uh, from there, my research line has been at the intersection of a behavior analysis, technology, leveraging the lean startup model and UDL to impact kids academic and behavioral performance. And so a lot of the work that we do at the Institute revolves around developing serious video games. So in the past, we've had some uh, some programs to support uh, public broadcasting system and their new superhero elementary games that just came out. And, um, and then we use the Lean Startup and Universal Design for Learning framework to make companion video games for that work. Uh, I believe there was a question real quick. One, uh, it, my, I, my, my first question, Ren, is to both of you is that, um, Special education is probably one of the fields that has used technology more than in other uh, areas. So I was just wondering about, um, can you just give some examples, some good examples of technological uses in SPED? So I would say probably the biggest 
claim to fame, and I, this is one that uh, OSEP, which is the Office of Special Education Research Programs, would be most excited about is closed captioning. So anytime you go to a movie theater and watch a movie, you can get uh, closed captioning options available. Uh, but there are a myriad of different uh, technological advances that have come out throughout the years from text to text to speech, from closed captioning, from looking at different types of colors on the screen. If you have a color blindness, for example, uh, there's a whole set of uh, W3C standards to provide support for all websites. So most publicly facing um, agencies like federal government, state governments, universities, et cetera, have to comply with those standards so that users have a better time accessing the content. Jamie, I know there's a bunch of- Yeah, I think, I think most of the time when people think about special education and they think about technology, they think of assistive technology. And assistive technology is generally technology that's assigned to an individual uh, student or an individual with a disability if, if they're beyond school years to provide for greater independence. And I, get, I think that's where when people think about um, oftentimes technology in special education, historically they think about assistive technology. But as you kind of hinted to Young, there's been a lot of um, growth and support around technology in general as, as Trey highlighted, but really we've had some growth in use within instructional technology. Um, obviously within the last year, there's been a lot of use of instructional technology, but even before that, there's been a lot of research around how to design uh, effective video games, for instance, on how to support better learning outcomes for students, uh, specifically in areas of STEM education. Um, but there's also a, a lot around, um, again, around providing greater accessibility and greater independence. And some of that is at the intersection of what we've talked about, I just talked about a few minutes ago, which is uh, the notion of how to support independence through digitizing materials, um, as well as then um, uh, bringing that forth with instructional technology, effective uses of instructional technology, uh, be it uh, back in the day, computer assisted instruction to uh, more web-based sort of applications uh, and to more innovative sort of things that are going on today with video games and even some virtual reality things that are pretty exciting. So Young asked me to jump in with this question that I typed out there. So, uh, so one of the things that I've often wondered about is that whether we have made a mistake in some ways by labeling technologies as being assistive technologies, because one of the things that I think is like, uh, I, I think closed captioning is a great one. Like I have closed captioning on for every movie I watch because I don't get half the dialogue sometimes because they are mumbling it or something's happening, you know? And so it's not designed for me, but I use it. And I know that, you know, if you take, let's say speech to text and you say, this is only for you as a certain kid, as opposed to make speech to text available to all students, you will find a whole array of students will use it, not because, you know, they have been labeled or whatever as being needing it, but they are just more comfortable listening to it and it complements the way they learn. And I see that, if I, you know, I think there are some specific ones for certain needs that might be very precise, but I think for the most of them, I think they can just be equitably like just given as options to all. And I wonder what your sort of thoughts are on that. Yeah, and I think that's where most of my work is focused on. I think Trey would say the same with his. I mean, this is where universal design for learning really kind of comes into play because what we've learned about with, with, with designing technologies is that if we really design for the edges, if we really design for the edges, we're really helping design for all learners. So Trey mentioned closed captioning earlier, right? And that's historically obviously thought of in a historic format for for people uh, who, who need to, who, who can't hear and need to, and read the closed captions. But the other thing is, is I'm sure we've all, I don't know if anyone's been to a bar lately, but we've all been to bars where the news is on or there's a game on and closed caption comes in quite handy in, in when you can't hear the announcer. Or uh, as I'm getting older here at the house and the kids are doing something upstairs, uh, using closed caption there. So that's a perfect example where we can take some of these more universally uh, focused technologies um, and really kind of focus on how we design and use these technologies for all learners. Um, 
you know, I, I used to carry around and talk about universal design all the time, right? The concept of universal design. And then we bring in learning to it. That's really at the intersection where we're talking about. And so when we think about how do we design these technologies, how do we design even websites or how do we design um, game systems? How do we reach the broadest, the broadest range of learners possible? Um, what sorts of considerations need to be put into that? What are sort of choices need to, do the users need to be given in, in supporting that? And I think, you know, really what a great silver lining over the last year, if we can stick with the theme of the podcast, is I think it's opened the eyes to, there's been a few of us in the field that have really talked about this for a long time. Um, and I think what a great silver lining in this is now, I think the world's opened up to this sort of consideration to say, this isn't really just about assistive technology. It's really about effective design of technology for all users, for all learners, right? And that's really, and that's been a real great success, one of the silver linings of the over the last year. So if I can build on this, um, if I had to sum up the field of educational technology in five words, it would be old wine and new bottles, <laughs> right? That we keep putting the same old stuff into the new media. Yep. And um, I think that, that print is, is an example of that. Yes. Uh, my former colleague, David Rose, would say that people aren't dyslexic. Print is a dys dyslexic medium. And of course, as you know better than I, there's all sorts of things that can be done to print to make it come alive so that anybody labeled dyslexic or not can, can interact with the medium in a rich way. But unlike closed captioning, after all this time, it's still PDFs. You know, what you're getting in, in e-readers is, is the worst part of, of what technology can do. It's old wine and new bottles. And it's so frustrating because there's always unintended benefits when you get to the new wine. And I think closed captioning is an interesting example. My younger daughter, half the time when we're watching a program, she'll either, uh, if we're willing to put up with it, she'll watch it in French with English subtitles to practice her French. Or if we're not willing to put up with it, she'll watch it in English with French subtitles to, to pick up on her French. And you know that's, that's an unintended consequence that's fabulous. So, how do we break through beyond closed captioning to get to these unintended benefits of things like print? I, I will take a quick stab at this. Uh, I think part of it is talking to individuals who make newer technologies with design and purpose uh, with UDL framework. So let me give you a concrete example. There are a lot of algorithms being developed right now for artificial intelligence. One of my colleagues, uh, for his work, he mines uh, CVs, vitas, and resumes in order to sift out the best possible people for a particular job. Well, one of the notions is that I work with a lot of students with autism who will be immediately siphoned off as not appropriate, but they have a lot of sub skills, which I think are of great value to different arenas. And so when I learned about this, algorithm and how it sifted through these Vita, I said, well, how do I get my kid who has autism to break the system and get to the top of the list? And he was just, you know, why would you break the system? It's perfect. It works great. And I said, but it's not perfect. You're discriminating against this pool of working individuals that could be of great value. And if we can somehow design this so it's more equitable, then that is something that we need to do. It's, and, and he had never even thought of that. And so I think, you know, if, if we're able to talk to folks who are creating these notions, these new ideas, these new innovative pieces with a universal design framework, it allows us then to maybe have these unintended consequences that you're talking about, Chris, and allow us to move in a direction that's different than the traditional norm. So uh, I have a um, question. I, I'm hesitant, hesitant to raise this question because it can be very controversial. But just following what Chris and what Punia was talking about, 
I have always argued with people. Reading may not be necessary for everyone. You now we use reading to define people. If you cannot read, you're basically considered, you know, useless. You know, in most societies, you know. Would you guys agree with me with the digital technology we have today that、uh, reading should not be required as a fundamental skill like we do today? You know, remember before.、Uh, Whoever invented the damn thing called, you know, the, the print machine, not everyone was required to read. And I think reading has its、uh, its time. So, 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 Trey and Jamie, I was just wondering what your thoughts about this. You know, should we use reading to define people as、uh, I don't know as healthy or not? In essence, that's how we define them to these kids. I mean, I think I think one of the things we have to recognize here is that as we think about the future. Um, as we think about the future, everyone we recognize obviously、uh, that you know there's a lot of variability in each one of us, right?、Um, and for some, right, there's as as Todd Rose would say, there's this jagged profile, right? That everyone's kind of got this jagged profile、um, where you're really high performer in some areas and、uh, kind of a lower performer in other areas, maybe somewhere towards the middle in others, but really there's not a real set sort of average. Uh, sort of growth trajectory that there's none of us average in everything, right? None of us are.、Um, so the reading thing is interesting because we do place a lot of we place a lot of weight in reading in education, right?、Um, and at some point there is going to be a turning point where reading is is minimized, I think, in some of the in some of the educational profiles. But I don't. I I would argue that we're not quite there yet. That we but. On the other hand, I think we really need to think about some of the newer literacies. Like, what does it actually mean to、uh, be able to produce uh, uh, a, a video, even or a podcast in in this new world? I mean, it used to be, and as professors, <laughs> you know, we we write papers. Well, the AI is going to start writing the papers for us, and what are we going to do with all of our time now?、Uh, when when a book or an AI is going to suddenly be writing for us? I think I think we have to think about actually what you you all are doing here, which is what are the new modes of communication, and how do we show、uh, competency in these new modes? And I think that's one of the things we have to think about as we think about the future, young. And so I'm not going to go as far as you're saying. Well, let's just diminish the need for reading.、Uh, I'm not quite there yet, but I do think we have to raise some of the other things up and maybe. Maybe bring down, balance it out with some of the newer mediums to, together and figure out what it all means. I don't know what Trey thinks. I'm going to let him get in front of the bus here. I would just say that I think my children, who are ages eight and eleven, read more than when I was ever in school. And I think inherently humans are creatures who like to communicate and. The communication style modality may vary across different technologies, but we will still figure out how to communicate. And you know, reading I think is one of those things. I, I look at it similar to writing. Like my kids are not learning how to write cursive, which kills me. But you know, I think about it. My physician never writes a script anymore; he just dictates it. And so. The written word, the reading word. I think the modality is going to change, but we're going to always reach out and talk to each other, communicate with each other in many ways. And I think it's just a different look in the future. But that's maybe I'm just conservative. <laughs> so I'll just do a really quick follow on, and then I want to toss it to Kurt, who's going to take this in a somewhat different direction. But、um, transmedia narratives are something that I find very interesting, where Each medium contributes something. There's the Harry Potter books and the Harry Potter movies and the games and the theme parks and the action figures, and so and the fan fiction, et cetera, et cetera. Every media adds something to it. When I was a graduate student, Marshall McLuhan was the big guru in this area, and he would talk about hot media like movies and cool media like print. And I always tell my kids and my students, if there's something that's in a book and in a movie, read the book first, because if you read the book after you see the movie, the characters are all predefined for you. 
And, and so that's a reason for print, Jan. That's actually a, a reason for print is that we need cool media as well as hot media. So I think literacy should be tra across trans media and stopping with reading is, is just as bad as I, as far as I'm concerned as eliminating reading because we're still only doing part of the spectrum. Kurt, you've been uncharacteristically silent. I'm gonna get out of the way. Well, they might want to comment on what you said. Um, so Trey or James, first, uh, do you have a comment on what Chris has said? Well, it's kind of highlighting some of the things I was kind of saying as well. I think it's the integration of the, the different medias that are critically important. I watch my kids do it all the time. I mean, I have a, a junior in high school and, a, and an eighth grader. And their first paper is always written like this when they're responding to a homework assignment. You know, they're, they, they, they respond by talking it in and they go and revise it. And they oftentimes then will shoot a video uh, to go along with it, you know? So I think, I think it's that, that integration that's that, that, that transmedia is important. Well, I'll do one from Pat, my friend, Patrick Dixon, formerly Michigan State first, and then I have one of my own. Um, Patrick's concerned about time. And in fact, regimentation of schools and our con control over our time. Will your center have anything to say about that? What can you offer? What does the field of special education have to offer students, learners, participants in general in terms of control over their time? Because he's worried about some want to accelerate, some want to take some, you know, deliberate and speculate and reflect. What kinds of technologies exist out there to enable the learners to have more sense of control over things? And does the field of special ed offer it? If it does, what can it offer to regular ed? I'll take a quick stab at this. So you're referring mostly to central executive function skills, which are, you know, how do you make sure you're on task, on time, getting all the assignments done on, on a timely manner, uh, setting an agenda, using your calculator, using your calendar, et cetera. Well, those technologies are available and special education has been at the forefront of assisting individuals with their executive function, with the notion that, you know, that development process of the prefrontal cortex is happening all the way up to adulthood uh, till 21. And so, like you said, there's gonna be a spectrum of skill set there. And the center will have, you know, some suggestions on how to support students in that type of arena. Uh, a lot of things will be done in terms of not only the learn design, which we'll get into later, but we'll also have uh, office hours for uh, folks to question and ask. Uh, they will also have an opportunity to look at some of our webinars that we'll deliver, podcasts we'll deliver. So th there's a lot of effort there in the executive function piece. And I think it's a real nice opportunity to infuse a lot of technology to support those central executive function skills. Okay. So I'll go to my qu follow-up question. It's going to not lead us in another direction maybe, but maybe it backs us up a bit. Can you talk about the center's original goals that you laid out in a proposal that, that established the center and what dissemination outlets are you looking towards as well as what marketing efforts are you thinking about using to build the audience for the center so you can get renewed in the future? Uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> undoubtedly the quest, first question we asked. Uh, have, you, have you any innovative thoughts in terms of dissemination and marketing, uh, but first talk about the goals. Yeah, that's a, that's, I can tell you a little bit more about the center. So uh, the center is the Center for Innovation, Design and Digital Learning. Uh, you can find it at CIDDL.org. Um, I'm sure we can post it here in the, in the, in the chat or um, on screen sometime. I don't know. Uh, I can't remember how you guys do things here, but um it, and, and by the federal name, it has a it has the longest name I think of any center I've ever seen come out of the federal government is the National Center to Improve Faculty Capacity to Use Educational Technology in Special Education, Early Intervention, Related Service Services, Personnel Preparation, and Leadership Preparation Programs. So um, it's a mouthful. So we just call it CIDL <laughs> um, for CIDDL. Um, and the, the goal of the center is really to increase uh, the knowledge, adoption, and use of educational technology across special education, early intervention, 
related service personnel preparation, and then future uh, faculty members, but really focused on how do we transform our colleagues? How do we work to supporting our colleagues uh, in understanding their use and increasing their use of technology? So we see that as a multifold sort of thing. We have a lot of faculty members out there um, um, that are really kind of needing some basic sort of understanding how to use the LMS system, right? Um, and then we have some that are really kind of on the cutting edge and thinking about sort of personalized learning, if you would, as you kind of just hinted to, Kurt. I mean, so we, so what we're doing is pro providing a range of uh, supports across multiple uh, communication mechanisms, one of them uh, being YouTube. Um, and we have kind of a, a fun little thing kind of going on right now uh, called Siddle Sizzles, which is learn about educational technology and how to cook in, uh, <laughs> um, in, a, in, a, in a short little pod, in a short little video series that we're putting together, which well, I'm sure Trey will talk about a little bit later because these are, I think, our next uh, guest cook. And we're hoping you guys might come on and show us how your cooking skills are. But the idea is to bring get people comfortable with something they already maybe do or something they do on a day-to-day -day basis and then introduce new things. And, and for some people, those new things are, are going to be like, how do I, how do I best use the LMS system that my school has provided? Um, but for other people, it's going to be, you know, what does AI mean to the future of, of education? And, and how do we then uh, bring people together to do that? So part of the other thing that we're challenged to do within the center is to really kind of create uh, digi digital learning communities or personalized learning communities, networks of people that are interacting. And it could be just interacting as we are here today, just small group, or it could be a larger group of people that are interacting. Um, it could be you know informal over coffee or, or drinks or something like that. Or it could be something that you know people get together and really have more of a formalized sort of effort over something. So um, we, we're really happy that our funders, OSEP, has provided us a lot, of, a lot of flexibility for what this means and how we measure success. But at the end of the day, our goals are to kind of increase that knowledge adoption and use uh, for our faculty members out there in the field. Trey's probably going to show some big fish he caught in uh, the Florida waters for his show, right? Well, that's a, that's a challenge. Yes, <laughs> we're going to try to do that. Was there another question? <laughs> I, can, I can raise a question. So every spring I teach a course on motivation and learning. And, and we talk about a couple themes that are directly related. Uh, one of them is implicit bias and one of them is stereotype threat. So the minute that you're labeled as special needs, there's some bad things that happen, even though the intent of special needs is for good things to happen. And do you have any, any ideas about how to unravel this puzzle of the fact that, that, in fact, we all are special needs, but what happens is we label a subpopulation and then both in terms of other people's beliefs and your own beliefs, there are negative consequences. Yeah, that's, that's uh, uh, I think we would all agree with that, right? Obviously, there's been lots of data on that. I think my colleague uh, here at KU, Tom Skurdick, would, would kind of get into the history of it. And he would look at the fact that, that, that one of the main reasons that special education has come forth is that the education system wasn't serving the needs of all learners from the very beginning. And so I think one of the things that we have to push forward on is how to make that happen. Um, personally, I've really been invested over the years, and Chris, you know this from some of the other stuff with the online center that, and Young knows this because we talk about it all the time, but around personalized learning, that if we truly all recognize that we are all variable, right, that this, this jagged edge sort of notion, this jagged profile that we all have is um, ongoing. Um, and that it actually isn't obviously just in K-12 years, it goes throughout our entire life, that we're all different and that if we can actually design an education system that meets those differences at the point of where they happen, that's, I think that's the future. I think, um, and I think that's actually 
part of the thing that's kind of come forth over the last year as well is that I think uh, in our own homes, we've recognized it. I recognize that my son was really good at going to school. <laughs> you know, he was really good, great at going to school. He wasn't so great at sitting home on the computer going to school. Um, my daughter, on the other hand, uh, she, she seemed to adjust quite well. Um, but we wouldn't have ever known that. And, and I think what we need to recognize and, and kind of the silver lining, if we stick with the theme again, is that, is that we have to really design an education system that is really learner centered from the very, very beginning. Um, and, you know, I know David Rose and we've all talked about this as well. I mean, that if we really thought about what it meant to be learner centered from the very, very beginning, we special education as we would as we know it would just kind of cease to exist i know i'm going to probably get hate mail somewhere uh overnight but um, but that's okay um but they would cease to exist it really it really kind of would um because there's not really the, the labeling that takes place is really around ensuring that appropriate funding and services could be put in place I mean, that's legally what it's for but if we could just have that at the very onset of every learner's need we wouldn't really need it I would just like to jump in real quick and bolster the fact that we haven't acknowledged the hardest part that we haven't impacted yet are the teachers. Like we've been talking a lot about students and the COVID situation. This center was identified as a, a potential center prior to COVID, uh, and, oh, actually before COVID, but uh, the, the fast paced movement to online instruction and the thrust of teachers into this environment that has historically not, you know, been at their bailiwick, it really put a, a light onto the situation that we have to support teachers in a different way to impact our students so we can personalize learn, you know, better. And this center has the opportunity to really support those teachers by providing a bunch of different technical assistance and training and connections so that they can enhance their repertoire of skills in an online platform as well as face-to-face. -face. And I think that's one of the, the huge highlights and opportunities that we have with our growing network. So um, I won't go back to debate with the, you guys about the, the necessity of literacy. But, but I can you know, at another time. Uh, I, I just had some, you know, I was just more having fun with that, you know. It's great to have all the transmedia, but if you cannot do it, should we force it? That's just my question, but that's another thing. But really, uh, we, we asked you guys to be here. Uh, Kurt stole the show. Uh, I was going to ask you to make a more formal introduction to your center. And, you know, I, I know you guys are cooking on YouTube, uh, all those kind of things. So, so I was really hoping that uh, um, you would lay out the center's plan because, you know, I'm kind of part of it, but I really want this to be a new innovation after COVID that can truly build a network of people interested in this. In, in, you know, uh, I'm, you, we kind of all have got grants in many different ways, but really, you know, Given all this money, with you know, there's by the way, it's never never enough money. Okay, to, to people who have got grants, but 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 given all the money we have given out, there should be some accumulative effect. So you know, you should you should not be so separated in you know, as a nation right now, right? So so I'm glad you know, like for example, the center now has uh, you know uh, has uh, Trey has cast as uh, Kansas, but really, how what can we do? to build a global, a national or global network of people contributing, sharing through this process, or maybe are there other efforts that's already doing this? That, that's a great question. I think one of the things we're, we're conscious of is we don't want to recreate PT3. <laughs> I think we've all, uh, 20 years ago or however long ago that was now, uh, 15 years ago, um, in fact, the very first time, and he doesn't remember, but the very first time I met Chris, I was working for a PT3 project at the University of Illinois. Um, and, and so that was funding my way through grad school. Um, and he kind of came to speak with a group, Tim Levin and folks there. Um, but um, so we realized this has been tried over and over again in education. And I think there's a lot of lessons learned from that. Um, but the, so the, the key is here, I think we have a, a 
a new way of going about it, right? We have from those lessons learned. So we know that um, we really have to come forth and, and bring people together in multiple ways. And so we have to recognize the same variability that we talked about uh, with our learners in K-12. We have to recognize that each one of our, each one of our colleagues ha- has it at the university level. Um, and so being able to design a center that meets the, the variability of needs uh, for across all faculty members is critically important. So we've, we've cr- tr- we're trying to build a center. We're just kind of getting started, by the way. So uh, I think we launched the website here in late January. Um, but we're trying to build a center that uses multiple outlets to connect and network. I don't know of anything currently out there. I mean, ISTE uh, as a professional organization has tried some things Um, So there's lots of organizations out there that are doing similar things. And one of the things that we're doing in the center is to kind of converge and think about where are those partnerships? So is is it working with folks over at ISTE that are doing some ed tech things? Is it working uh, with AACT, I mean, AACTE or other groups that are already doing some stuff around teacher education and technology um, and trying to have these places where People can converge, but it maybe is for short-term periods. Maybe it's not going to be like, I'm going to do an entire sort of um, a book study. Maybe it's just, I'm going to come in. And like I said, maybe it's that you're going to have uh, a, a cocktail or a coffee with uh, some folks that you're needing, you want to talk to around some topics. So, and then, and then as well as offer some more formalized training uh, prep, prep, uh, uh, presentations and such so that, so that people can come and get that deeper understanding, can come and, and do that deeper thing. And, and so we're trying to come up with a host of ways of doing it. And we're using some of the technology on the leading edge. So we're using a lot of learning analytics on the background, a lot of the analytics driving what is going on. And so we are luckily uh, tied to uh, Jody Britton and the folks at Materi who are helping us with the evaluation and using a lot of the analytics in the background that are gonna drive some of our, some of our uh, services and such. Trey, I don't know if you wanna jump in. No, I think we had a question um, that Danny was posing and I'm gonna go ahead and read it if that's okay. Uh, and that was, uh, can you tell us a little bit about Siddle Sizzles and the events and how can we participate? And since I'm the one that's leading the next one on the 13th, I will let you know that you can navigate to the website. There is a YouTube and Facebook live event that will showcase the Siddle Sizzles. Uh, What we do is we identify a piece of education technology that you can integrate into your classroom or your instruction. And then we also apply that technology into cooking. And so for example, my uh, technology will be about podcasting and I will showcase how podcasts can be integrated into your curriculum. And then at the end, I will show you how my children and I listen to a podcast to cook bread and we will showcase how that happens. And so it's trying to bring it down to the user level and making it as user-friendly as possible and uh, practical. And then from there, uh, there are opportunities to ask questions to the team. And well, then- I have a question, but uh, I, I just can't resist. I want to jump in. How do you guys connect this with food? <laughs> and, uh, where did you get that idea? I'm, I'm really curious so, about this. You know, so uh, Matt Marino, one of our colleagues, kind of came up with the idea. And the Ooh. idea is to Matt Marino, who is okay. a professor down at UCF kind of came up with the idea and the idea is to gamify professional development, right? So the other piece that we haven't told you about is that there's a prize at, you know, so it's, it's a, it's not only learning ed tech, but it's a cooking show at the same time. And so the idea is, is that you're going to be able to go through and we're going to have multiple people kind of come on and demonstrate their skills and have that intersection of ed tech and, and cooking. And then they are, we're going to vote. Uh, throughout the season. And we're going to bring people into Florida in November to actually have a cook-off. Uh, and so there's going to be a kind of a prize at the end of the day. And so we're trying to make it, we're trying to gamify it. Um, and so some of the aspects that are in the proposal really kind of talk about how do we, how do we use gamification? How do we use uh, the idea of networking and building networks? Uh, how do we bring all that into play? And so that's integrated into what our our vision is here. 
And then just right. dovetailing, just dovetailing into my world of behavior analysis, where are the reinforcers for people? And usually food brings people to the table. And uh, if we can root it in food, everyone likes to have at least a good bite every once in a while. And young, personally, I'd just like to see you try and cook. I'd like to just see that. I think that'd be hilarious. Well, I, I can, I can, I can do a great show of cooking, and uh, which is uh, nothing. I, I, I don't know how to do it, so I will try to learn. Maybe you can do a, like a, um, a technology and learning to cook show or something like that. Yeah. But I want to get back to Kurt. Kurt, go, go ahead. I can attest that he doesn't know how to cook because when I visited Eugene, he bought me lunch uh, at a restaurant because he can't cook. Uh, <laughs> there's a question before my question um by we punya's put up here do we mean grad students studying at kansas or outside of kansas we're really focused we're really focused on all everyone i mean the the center is a really broad mission uh one of the things that uh osep communicated with us very clearly when we were funded was we're really kind of focused on every faculty member, grad students uh, across the nation, faculty members across the nation. And actually we've had a lot of uh, interaction with folks overseas already and, and really all across the globe. So uh, we as a center are trying to do what we can, not only in the United States is obviously what we're charged to, to focus on, but really focus on, on globally as well. I mean, we have some fellowship opportunities for uh, faculty members that are wanting to get involved and some internship opportunities for grad students uh, that want to be involved. And it doesn't matter where you're studying. Uh, we have an opportunity there. If you go to the website at uh, CIDDL.org, uh, you can kind of look it up and kind of figure out where you can kind of collaborate with us. And we'd love to hear from folks and uh, get people engaged from throughout the world. And James, it's nice to hear another student who is mentored by James Levin. Seems like he had a, a, a great time there at Illinois when he was at Illinois. So many people I've met that, that have been influenced by him uh, before he went to San Diego. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Um, so the question I have is if you get the Ed Researcher, the most recent one in April starts off with, well, not the first article, second article, when logics collide, implementing technology enabled personalization in the age of accountability. And as you talked about personalization, there has been um, sort of a hot topic in education today. I've studied myself in the area of MOOCs, um, but they, in this article, they talk about the Zuckerberg Foundation, the Gates Foundation, putting a lot of money and emphasis on it. So people at Teachers College looked at five schools, uh, urban schools in mathematics education and came to the conclusion that teachers are extremely excited about it in the front end, but as we would expect, extremely frustrated on the back end because of the lack of support and lack of tie-in with the norms, expectations, procedures, and accountability that is a, in, ingrained in the system. And so, you know, and they don't have the time to build the wraparounds or the support structures as individual teachers to deal with that, to deal with both sides, the, the personalization side and the accountability side. Have you seen any successes out there, that uh, success stories out there that you'd like to speak to? Yes, uh, we ha I have. Uh, some of the work that we did in the Center for Online Learning and Students with Disabilities some years ago looked at some more innovative sort of places around the nation that were doing some, some great things with uh, personalized learning. Um, many of those places now are not doing that same thing any longer, right? For various reasons, primarily political, that they weren't continually supported in doing that work. And that often happens. It's actually one of the saddest things I'd ever seen because in one of our poorest cities of the nation, I was seeing great learning outcomes for all students and have actually published on this work and have looked at looking at how students with disabilities and students without disabilities were making two or three years growth uh, in, in various areas uh, in a more personalized model. But the, what the teachers had there was very different from what they have in most everyday schools. They really had systems designed to help the teacher support personalized learning. And it was all based on universal design for learning. And so um, unfortunately, some of the more innovative spaces aren't are not in existence anymore. I'm sure there's some more out there. There's plenty more out there. We have to find them, but unfortunately our funding uh, uh, laps on that and we're not funded to look at that, that information anymore. But I think this is actually something that we as a community of folks that are studying sort of 
educational technology really need to spend some time focused on. But as Young knows, and we've talked about it plenty of times, I mean, it really does come down to the assessment. I mean, if the assessment's gonna drive everything, um, there's various unintended consequences or, or maybe even intended consequences of the assessment um, and the way that we're thinking about assessment in, in education. Chris might have a comment on that. Uh, maybe maybe your center might uh, want to address that in a follow-up grant, you know, when you get renewed, that might be an area. Maybe our team here in Silver Lining might want to collect some of those stories, you know, at some point. So um, we can all make a concerted effort in that regard. It's an important topic. Yeah, I think so too. You know, there's, there's no question that the biggest barrier to innovation in education across the board is the assessment and accountability systems. And uh, one of the silver linings was that those were temporarily at least disrupted. And, and the hope was that we would learn something from that about alternative forms of assessment that could be used in complement. Uh, and unfortunately that doesn't seem to have happened. I, I wrote a blog uh, that's on the silver, it, it's on a website called Measurement Matters. Uh, by Andre Rupp, who is a psychometric specialist who takes a broad view of assessment. And in the blog, I said, look, all these psychometricians are being laid off because the, the big testing companies don't have a way to deliver their services. This is a wonderful opportunity to step up and create some new things that do alternative forms of assessment. And I think the problem with places like, like Gates and CZI and by saying this, I'm probably committing suicide in terms of getting funding from them ever again, but you got to tell it like it is, is that they'll fund things, but then they won't think through the systemic nature of what they're funding and fund all the other things that have to happen in order to get success. So you have kind of travesties like the Gates Small High School, where just being small was going to be the secret sauce that was going to solve everything. And until those foundations are willing to think systemically, they're just going to waste a lot of money. And, 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 and then people say, well, personalized learning doesn't work. We threw money at it. It didn't work. You know, uh, I'm going to, again, trying to be controversial since I brought you guys on. So you work in special education. And recently, I think we are, uh, uh, you know, Jamie, I think you and, you're on this one. You, you and I are co-authors for this, uh, of, uh, um, this book uh, about redefining talents in really the talented and gifted programs. So basically you have two ends, you know, politically there's arguments between the two groups, the special education group and the gifted and talented programs. So what's, um, what's your view on that? And, and I know so you, you, you know very well how they are selected, how they're identified. I think these are the two controversial groups because just now you, when, you, when you responded, I think to Chris and uh, Kurt's questions, you're talking about personalization. If we can do that, it's good for everybody. So, so in essence, we would not have any of the programs, but, but at this moment, you know, right now, we really have those two groups that they're doing great group and they're not doing so great group. That's why I think Chris was talking about, we have the label of spare, special education. So I just want to hear your, your comments and uh, would you want to do something at the center in talking about that? Trey or Jamie, go, go for it. This I was waiting for Trey, to, I was waiting for Trey to jump in front of the train, but he, he chose not to. <laughs> He's smarter than that. <laughs> so, I think it's I think it's interesting, right? Because I do think that when we think about this sort of intersection of technology and and, and human learning and growth, there there it's going to uncover various unintended consequences, positive, negative, et cetera, right? Where when we start introducing more technology to our classrooms as we've done over the last year, we're learning that some of the kids, as I said with my own son, some of the kids that were doing just fine, in, in the uh, physical environment that was, by the way, they were assigned with iPads and all this kind of stuff. He was doing just great. But as soon as he moved to a fully online environment, it wasn't working. Now, I would argue, I would argue as someone that studies this stuff, 
the type of online environment he was put in was not very well designed. And that goes back again to the preparation of the educators and the supports educators have, have been provided to actually design these more immersive and, and online, environment, online environments. So to your question, Young, um, you know, I think the center is going to have to, to, to talk about this a little bit because I think in some of the more, and again, we have various sort of aspects of the center. And one of the nodes that we're kind of focused on is uh, being a thought leader. And I think we're going to have to, to a certain extent, um, provide some thought leadership around what this means for the future. I mean, there's lots of other things. I mean, if we get into some of the fourth industrial revolution sort of issues that are going to be happening to society overall, I mean, you know, some of the stuff going on with CRISPR right now, some of the more, you know, some of the genetic things going on right now, these are things that are going to be direct, directly impacting uh, individuals and families with disabilities. And I think as an education system, we have to recognize that. We also have to have conversations about what this actually means um, and how do we actually support the future of education. But if we really, and I, I have, to, you know, I'm going to, there's a disclaimer that the Department of Education, obviously, whenever they fund a project, they don't um, necessarily agree with the policies and things said of the person, <laughs> of the person uh, um, that's been funded. But what I'll clearly say is that, you know, the future is upon us and it's happening at a more rapid pace than it's ever happened before. Um, and I think one of the silver linings that we've had come out last year is that I think the greater society is starting to recognize that. Um, and we know what happens in these very disruptive phases of societal change where we have some that are really kind of pulled back and have said, we need to get back to the old ways. And then some that are pushing forward and then kind of some that are stuck in the middle waiting for some guidance. And so I think what the center is going to have to do is, is kind of provide at least some thought leadership around what this all means. And it, it definitely is going to impact, um, I, I think, in the future, what it means to have a disability, who is being identified, how they're being identified. Um, who, who's high performing, who's not high performing. You know, one of the studies we did years ago, we were designing a, had a project where we're designing iPads and we actually wrote the proposal for the grant bef before the iPad actually came out um, because we saw the announcement. We're like, oh, we definitely got to get funding to develop something around this. And so one of the things we wanted to look at was frustration thresholds. And because we wanted to build in some personalization around when, when uh, help would, when structures would come in to scaffold the, the students going through the, the thing. And what we found out was that the highest performing learners, the highest performing learners actually uh, had the very lowest frustration threshold. They were like, oh my gosh, something's not right. I need to, I need to get some help right away. Uh, whereas the learners with the disabilities, the students with the learning disabilities would persist continually, continually, continually and try and do different things. And so I think these are some things that are going to have to be considered as we think about the future. So, so Trey, uh, I want to get your, your view because I, I've been struggling with this. In essence, if you use Todd Rose jacket profile, you know, in essence, if you look at the weak point, you probably go to special ed. If you look at your high point, you probably go to the talented and the gifted, you know. So, so Trey, what, what's your what's your thinking about this question? My thinking is that it relates back to what Chris and Kurt were bringing up with regards to assessment. And I believe that our traditional assessment profiles will be changing given that we're leveraging multimodal data from multiple sources of sensors and that will hopefully enhance how personalization occurs and if we're able to do this correctly then breaking folks apart into designated sections hopefully goes away uh, because I innately know that I have kids that I've worked with that have strengths and weaknesses across multiple different levels and none of them are the same. And that's a great thing because that allows us to build a team that then can tackle a problem with different inputs coming in and it will have a better outcome than someone that always thinks the same way. And so I think the center's responsibility is to do two things. One, to talk about it with the general population and provide some initial thought 
you know, behind these decisions, but then two, to break things down into a way that is achievable and consumable to a wide variety of audiences, not just talking to the folks that are on one end of the spectrum who have a deep understanding that are technical, but also to the average Joe on the street who may not understand the technical side, but understands that this is something that could play a pivotal role in their future. My colleague, Howard Gardner, hates it when I do this, but multiple intelligences means multiple stupidities because none of us is intelligent in everything. And that the whole gifted thing is very suspect to me. Gifted in what? And, and how stupid are you in the other areas? And, and you know, should you be getting remedial rather than gifted? It's an interesting question. Uh, Chris, I, I love what you call multiple stupidities and multiple intelligence. That, that basically goes around the, the same issue, but you know, when you're gifted, you have to be bad. You know? So that's, I think, the whole, whole thing you know, about this jagged profile is that uh, you know, look at any gifted, any great person has some weaknesses. That, that's just, but I think our education just use a very homogeneous you know, set of standards to judge students, but then we also favor you know, certain subjects. You know, certain subjects are favored a lot more. So this goes back to all the assessment issue. But I know Kurt has another question. Kurt will introduce be, the next uh, uh, episode right. as well. It'll be a quick question because we have to introduce the next show. But over the years, play, certain institutions have been known for different disciplines. For instance, the University of Illinois for reading research and a reading center. University of Wisconsin, where I went to school, mathematics. Here at Indiana, social studies, right? Carnegie Mellon and Pittsburgh writing, as well as intelligent tutoring systems at, at Carnegie Mellon. And at Kansas, it was special ed, right? Always. So are there other institutions, other places, other organizations that we're gonna look to for leadership, thought leaders that you just talked about, James? Who are the, uh, where are the other thought leaders out there for special ed and for all these areas that you're gonna be pursuing? Uh, that's a great question. I mean, part of the reason we brought on the University of Central Florida, Trey and Matt and the team down there is because I think they're really doing some innovative research and work down there at the University of Central Florida. Um, and they have the opportunity to do that because they're provided with, uh, you know, a lot, a lot of national defense contracts and other things that are really bringing forward uh, some innovative technologies. Um, so I, I would think Central Florida is one of them. Um, there's, there's, there's probably others out there and we, I know we don't probably have much time here to get into it because I know you guys are going to want to jump off, but, um, Trey, I don't know if you want to throw into some of them. You know, I think there are thought leaders all across the nation. And what's interesting is that, uh, there used to be, I think, a large group of folks at different locations, like you were talking about, Kurt, I think that's much more spread out these days. And, our hope is that the center will be an opportunity to connect those folks and have an opportunity to have this dialogue and say, hey, if you're in Texas, if you're in California, anywhere you are, here's an opportunity to have this conversation and move the agenda forward. Okay, yeah, and I knew about the gamification stuff at UCF because you got the Army Research Institute and others funding many things. I wanna introduce the next show, which would be, um, episode 58, which will take us to Finland and beyond. Two guests from Finland starting an organization called CARDI, which is Critical Applied Research for Digitalization in Education. Uh, but they have other people coming in as well from Sao Paulo, from uh, Cork, Ireland, and um, from the UK, uh, and from Sao Paulo, Brazil. So uh, we're going to have an interesting show next time talking about critical applied research on digitization of education. The show title is Unpacking the Digitization and Datification of Education, Thoughts from Finland and Beyond. So a couple of friends of mine leading the effort. So we'll be hearing from them next week, Mark Kircher and uh, Marco Tiras. I hope you enjoyed this show and I hope you come back next time. <music>